Now, Ian, I hear you've been off doing the hard work for us, reading climate reports so that the rest of us don't have to. There were two reports you listed in your article, The State of the Climate 2023 by the Ole Humlum, I hope I got that right, and the Wyoming Climate Report by the CO2 Coalition. And even that makes me want to reach for a glass of red. Why did you torture yourself? What were, what were these reports about and why were you reading them? Well, they're 140 pages altogether. I read them to keep up to date. I read them to um, see what people right across the spectrum are writing about and are thinking. Unlike the other side, I do read everything and I find it quite interesting. And I try to share that interest with specky readers. Well, one of the, uh, you had a whole list of findings that you had from reading these articles. And one of them was, and I'm just going to quote part of it here, it was about data for the Pacific Decadal Oscillation POD extending back to 1854. It is in phase with the global temperature changes and tied to the sea surface temperature in the planet's largest ocean. Now, this was basically about surface temperature and global air temperature. And it ends up saying the changes in the PDO are unrelated to atmospheric sea. CO2. Why was that of interest to you? Can you explain to our readers where you were going with that observation? Yes, I, I'm a, that's of interest because uh, the ocean exchanges heat with the atmosphere. And the ocean gets most of its heat, not all of it, but most of its heat in the top few metres, which comes from sunlight. And so if you get changes in ocean surface temperature, that's telling you something's happening with the sun. That's unrelated to carbon dioxide. So we've had a cold period from about 1945 to 1975 when the Pacific uh, decadal oscillation was negative. So we had a temperature decrease in the surface temperature of the oceans and that meant that there was less heat to be transferred to the atmosphere and so it was cooler. Now, the air doesn't hold much heat. It is water that holds heat. It's got a very, very high capacity to hold heat. So when we see times of the warm oceans, that's the top of the ocean, we have warm weather. We had a warm period between 1977 and 1998, and that was when the Pacific Decadal Oscillation was positive. So the temperature uh, had slightly increased in the surface of the oceans, and that heat was transferred to the air. Now, we can measure that. Now, what we see when we plot carbon dioxide is that it continues to rise, yet we have global temperatures rise and fall, and these are related to ocean temperatures. So clearly there's no relationship between atmospheric carbon dioxide and the temperature of the atmosphere, and we've known that for a very, very long period of time. But this Global Warming Policy Foundation summary of the climate basically confirms what we already know. And what this report gave were measurements. They didn't give any models at all. Very little interpretation, just measurements. Hear the measurements, work it out for yourself. And that's the way science ought to work. Well, there's something to be said for the beauty of raw data and allowing people to actually look at the data as it comes out instead of just reading reports about that data. Now, Ian, we've got the uh, Pacific Islands fake crying about rising sea levels when they, you know, they're still selling their deep sea mining deposits to China under the table mm -hmm. in accordance with the Blue Economy Memorandum of Understanding. So they're not really worried about sea levels rising unless, of course, Albanese is somewhere nearby and they think they can scam some Australian taxpayer money off him. So what I have seen a lot from our readers is the question of, is the sea level rising? Is it rising catastrophically? And is this any different to the long-held trends of sea level changes? Well, sea level is rising very, very slightly. And that what is exactly what we'd expect after um, a period called the Little Ice Age. We've been in an interglacial now for some 14,700 years. Uh, sea level has risen during that period 130 metres. So we are getting very slight sea level changes, but the models are absolutely totally incorrect. And this report, uh, which I wrote about, uh, gives a very good example of that. Sea level change in Oslo has been measured for a very long period of time, for about 120 years. Now, in Oslo in Norway, there are models to show that the sea level is going to rise. It's going to rise alarmingly. And, oh, you, you, you'd better worry about this. And it was going to rise some enormous figure, 
um, when in fact it's fallen, and it's fallen over the last 120 years. Now, the rise predicted, and I'll have to look at my specky article, and God knows <laughs> where I wrote about this, um, but, um, well, you'll have to read it in the specky article, but... Um, so we, we've got a lot of evidence of sea level measurements which are showing that they're totally out of accord with the models and these sea level measurements don't really consider what the land's doing. The land is rising in many parts of the world. That's why the sea level has appeared to uh, fall at Oslo. The land is actually sinking in other per parts of the world and that's why it looks as if a sea level rise. So you cannot talk about sea level changes unless you talk about the land level changes and don't you try to tell me, oh, this is just geology, everything happens slowly. We know from historical measurements that sea level and land level rise and fall. We know from historical measurements that the land level rises and falls very quickly, and it can rise a few metres in a 1,000 years. This is um, clearly the same sort of measurements we're getting for sea level rise. So if you're on the coast and the sea level's dropping, uh, then everything's fine. But if you're on the coast and, and the land level's falling, then you've got a relative sea level rise. So you have to be very, very careful when you talk about sea level change. And this is what this Ole Humlin report from the Global Warming Policy Foundation tells us. Be very careful. Yes, well, when I was uh, doing the research on this a long time ago, that was the problem there because sometimes the land was going up, sometimes the land was going down. So trying to get a stable sea level <laughs> reading is very difficult. I mean, Australia is not bad. We don't really do much, but a lot of places are geologically active and so it's very difficult to get a global thing. I also noticed they don't seem to be very concerned about land rising <coughs> levels. They're worried about sea level, but what about the uh, places growing mountains? It doesn't seem to worry anybody that that's going on. But I want to ask you... Well, that, uh, that's even more important because if you've got mountains close to the sea, there's a gravitational attraction from these mountains. So you pull the sea towards the mountains. So if you've got a mountainous coast, as you have, say, um, in the Pacific coast along the Andes, then it's pulled seawater towards it and seawater is higher because sea level is higher. And in fact, if you're sailing across the Pacific from the Andean coast uh, to the centre of the Pacific, you're actually going downhill. So um, that's because of the gravitational influence of mountain ranges close to the sea. So you cannot have a mean or an average sea level. It's just total nonsense. That's actually quite a, a cool fact that I didn't know. Now, I wanted to ask you, uh, the Climate Change and Energy Minister Chris Bowen went on and on and on last week about the Victorian blackouts, and he blamed them on unprecedented storms caused by climate change. What did you think when you heard a statement like that? Well, I, I think you should just keep talking. He's the best thing the Liberals have got. <laughs> just keep him talking, keep him talking. Um, and once the word's unprecedented, is used, you know that the person has absolutely no knowledge of the past and the background. What has happened is Victoria had the cheapest electricity in the world and the price was pushed up by having mandated wind and solar energy, and these are called renewables, and the only thing renewable about renewable energy are the subsidies, and they have then um, artificially made coal-produced um, electricity very expensive. Uh, if you take away all the subsidies and take away these alternatives to uh, power, it's very, very cheap. The second thing is um, we have no evidence that climate change is actually affecting storm activity. We do have evidence to the opposite, saying that storm activity and hurricanes over the last 100 years have decreased. And that was actually mentioned in this report that I reviewed uh, in The Spectator. We've known about this for a very long period of time, for more than 100 years, the intensity and number of hurricanes and cyclones and very intense storms has been decreasing. The reason for that is we don't know but it's certainly not a result of climate change. So I think um, the minister was trying to score a few points, trying to justify himself, uh, and maybe 
it might be something to do with a by-election in Victoria coming up very soon. I think he was a little bit embarrassed because Labor's run out of coalition people to blame for things like energy towers falling over and blackouts. Uh, I've got one last question of my own before I move on to our, our uh, readers' questions. The Wyoming Climate Report right, by the Co CO2 Coalition, they're quite interested in this idea of burying carbon. I want to ask you, what do you think of companies that are going into this frenzy to capture carbon and bury carbon to save the planet? Is there any merit in that concept? Well, it is. They do it for financial reasons. They will actually have to pay more taxes uh, and not get the carbon credits if they don't bury the carbon dioxide. And some of us used to hug trees, but as my girth has increased, I find that harder. So now I burn fossil fuels to put carbon dioxide out there as plant food. Why bury plant food? This is the most anti-environmental thing you could do, is to bury carbon dioxide, especially in Wyoming, which is a coal-producing state of the US. Yeah, I think it might be to do with uh, a different type of green, money green for that matter. But look, oh, you've got a lot yes, of... Yes, yes, green back. You've got a lot of fancy, and I thought I might put some of these questions for you. One of our readers, Mrs Chip, said, and I quote, can we really adapt to climate change in get me over the great divide? If I have a few extra days in summer, I'm a dead person. Miss, uh, Ian, can you get Mrs Chips over the divide? Can we adapt to climate change? Well, yes. If, if you move from Helsinki to Singapore, you have an average temperature rise of 30 degrees Celsius. You don't die. We had a lot of Finns uh, from the Atukumpu area in Finland come and work in Mount Isa, where the uh, summer temperatures are over 40. These people didn't die. They might have died from over-drinking, but they <laughs> certainly didn't die from the temperature. So we are very adaptable organisms, and we as humans can live on the ice sheets, we can live in the tropics, we can live in the mountains, we can live on the coast. Um, a, a few degrees Celsius makes no difference. If I go outside on this fairly warm day in Adelaide, and it's a warm day because for some strange reason it's warm, it's called summer. Now, if I go outside, the temperature change is about 15 degrees Celsius. It will not kill me. And I can very easily survive a warmer climate. And in fact, we humans are creatures from the Rift Valley. We go on our holidays to warm climates. If warm climates were lethal, we wouldn't do that. We'd go to um, the Nordic countries and um, the Antarctica for our holidays. We wouldn't go to warm tropical areas. So we love the heat. And we are creatures that come out of a warm climate. Yes, well, I mean, you could also try living in Sydney. It was 22 degrees yesterday and it's 36 degrees today. So that's a pretty significant climate change in 24 hours. And, you know, I haven't died, so touch wood, that's OK. We can handle massive changes in temperature. Now, Graham says that we're not far away from ministers imposing taxes to cancel volcanic eruptions. That's probably next on Mr Bowen's list, actually. And uh, Richard of Oz <laughs> says, uh, Professor Ian Plymer is a living treasure. That's not really a question. It's more like a comment. But uh, here's... here's Here's a last question. Uh, Vic Jerskis, who is one of our writers, says, good on you, Ian. Given the vast number of natural variations and trends in troposphere temperature, ocean temperature, the Southern Oscillation Index, et cetera, et cetera, is there such a thing as a global temperature? Well, Vic is a great man. He's done a huge amount on our uh, forests and how we had Aboriginal fire burning, uh, how most of the myths we hear about bushfires, he has shown a wrong. He is a, a, a natural scientist who is looking at the way nature works. So um, we, we see from nature huge amounts of variability, and I've been gas bagging on and forgotten your very last line, which was his question. Uh, is there such a thing as global temperature, given all the fluctuations well, around the world? Uh, well, he knows the answer to that. Um, of course there isn't. Um, how can you have an average temperature between the South Pole and, say, the deserts uh, of Saudi Arabia? Uh, South Pole, it might be minus 80, and the deserts of Saudi, I've worked there, uh, it's 55 Celsius. Now, you can't get an average temperature when you've got most of the temperature measuring stations in cities in the U.S., and in uh, Europe. You have very few measuring stations in oceanic areas. You have them in all different locations. It is not possible to get an average temperature. And if you did, 
what on earth does it tell us? Um, so to talk about an average temperature is absolute nonsense. Um, the average temperature at one location uh, might have some meaning as long as you haven't tampered with the data, which the Wyoming uh, report shows where the data had been doctored, where they'd used uh, measuring stations and said there was data from those measuring stations, yet these stations didn't exist or were closed down. So um, if you're going to use that sort of data, it makes it even more ridiculous. And in many cases, many of the temperature measurements are just fraudulent. 